Let's pray together. Father, this beautiful spring weather has <coughs> reminds us daily of your goodness and grace to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. You bring new life to deadness and you bring light out of darkness and you bring uh, <coughs> warmth out of that which is dead and cold. And You've done that to our hearts, Father, and you have restored us into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ and you have given us the joy of walking with him day by day. Lord, we thank you for all of that. and Most of all, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins that we can uh, come before you on a daily basis with hearts made willing by your Spirit to love you and to honour you and to get our hearts right before you. And Father, we thank you for the institution of marriage and we thank you that uh, we can spend this time looking at marriage and we ask, Father, that today as we look at the, uh, the, those things that can destroy marriage that you would just encourage our hearts again and, and um, cause us in our hearts again to recommit ourselves to this wonderful institution that you've set up for men and women. So we ask you to be with us today and we thank you for bringing Hans safely back to us with all his grandchildren and, and uh, ask that you bless him too tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's our second lecture on marriage and we're going to be talking about infidelity and divorce. Now we, we noted that this um, age stage we're dealing with is one is the age stage where most of uh, <clears throat> most of our seekers are going to come from, and uh, the most of the most of those seekers will bring issues of marriage to the counselling process, and in many cases those marriage issues will concern uh, issues to do with uh, infidelity and marital unfaithfulness. Uh, as you can imagine, there's been um, a lot written on this issue both in secular and in Christian literature because it's such a prevalent issue in marriage and such a devastating issue in marriage that it's a uh, it's one that counsellors, pastoral counsellors uh, have to deal with on a unfortunately on a regular basis. So we're going to look at infidelity then we're going to do a little bit on divorce. Uh, mainly centred around uh, how to respond to it in a counselling context. Our culture has given up on marriage. <clears throat> it has romanticised infidelity. The adulterer is often referred to as the lover. It has normalised divorce, yet infidelity is still considered to be wrong. We refer to it as cheating. Uh, you, you'll be aware that right now on the news uh, is uh, we have this incident in America with the head of the CIA and another general caught up in a in a in an infidelity with two other women, and uh, you, you notice the way that it's uh, portrayed. It's not pro portrayed as a tragedy. It's not portrayed as a disaster, even though it's all of those things for the man's wife and family, and for the man himself, and certainly for their marriage. But it's portrayed as something interesting, newsworthy, and uh, <clears throat> something to uh, to speculate on and to tut tut over. And yet, <clears throat> there's no question that in that portrayal of the news um, on the on that issue that the wife has been wronged. That can't be hidden from the fact and uh, of the reality of the situation. And as more and more is uncovered about the details of that affair, um, we find that that uh, the whole attitude is, well, isn't this to be expected? Isn't this part of what life is like in the 21st century? Really, we've given up on the idea that marriage should be uh, monogamous and uh, for a lifetime. So we need as counsellors, as Christians, as Christian leaders, we need a strong stand on this issue of marriages are to survive and grow. Most of the affairs are about the marriage and not the third person. Simon, you want to come and get this? Mostly affairs are about the marriage and not the third person. So uh, you have a couple come to you 
and there's been infidelity in the marriage so we have uh, there's the um, the husband and there's the wife and there's a third person now when they come to you for counseling on this issue you see these two coming for counseling and uh, in, in their counseling uh, there's going to be a tendency to focus on this third person who's not there in the room as if somehow <coughs> The third person is the cause and so uh, the husband will come up with all kinds of reasons why this person was the cause of it and the wife will do likewise now why do they do that well they're trying to protect their marriage they're trying to assuage their guilt and their shame and perhaps in this case if it's the husband that's offended if he's the <coughs> one who was offended and she uh, offended and he she is the offended one then the the uh, He's going to try and assuage his guilt by saying, well, you know, this woman, whatever, you see. And she's going to try and assuage her, sa her shame, so he's carrying guilt and she's carrying shame. She's going to try and deal with her shame by saying, well, you know, it was this one's fault. In other words, they're making the third party the primary cause for the infidelity. Well, you don't want to buy into that. Most fears are not about... Uh, most fears are about the marriage, they're not about the third person. The failures in the marriage are the primary cause of the affair. The third party is a secondary cause. The primary cause of the infidelity is a failure in the marriage. Sexual unfaithfulness happens when a new relationship forms as a reaction to something in the marriage relationship which is not considered right or deficient. Now, exceptions to that would be when an affair is a one-night stand or with a prostitute, but even then the adultery has more to say about the state of the marriage than about the sexual lust of the offending party. Now, I had a, I had a couple come to me and, and uh, they walked in on the first session and I knew that the issue was adultery. He walked in on the first session and before he'd even sat down, he said to me, um, I'm a sex addict. Well, it turned, around, it turned out that he was, <clears throat> he was a serial adulterer. He had had, he had countless affairs beginning uh, during their engagement period even, which she knew about. <clears throat> and um, you see, he was trying to put the, uh, the reason for it down to um, lust or sexual addiction, lust which he felt was certainly beyond his control. And... Um, as we got talking, we found out that, in fact, uh, there was so much about this marriage which, which wasn't working at an emotional or an intimate level for either of them. Um, and so it wasn't about his lust, it wasn't about the third person, though all those are involved, it was about the breakdown in the marriage relationship. Now, they're sitting there talking to you and... Uh, this is, uh, between them, is the relationship and it's the relationship that your counselling is focused on. In other words, you have to be very careful that if, he's the, if the husband is the offending party, that you don't, in your counselling, that you don't become prejudiced against the husband out of sympathy for the wife. Your focus is on the relationship. The relationship is the primary cause of the infidelity. Your job as a counsellor is to is to help them under see, uh, help them to see where in the relationship there's been a breakdown, such that infidelity has been allowed to come in and threaten the relationship. <clears throat> so, how does an extramarital affair begin? Well, these new relationships begin. The words that are spoken, uh, words that are spoken at a level of emotional intimacy, or words that ex that express emotional attraction, it does not begin with sex. Uh, sex comes later. Long before intercourse has taken place, there has been something going on between the two of them at an emotional level, with words that are spoken, with. Um, uh, perhaps there's been some kind of touch, but it begins with words. It begins with um, a word which, uh, uh, words that are spoken that have a level of intimacy to them that now become secret to that couple. 
to those two people. Before sex, many things have happened in this new relationship that should have remained in the marriage. Infidelity and faithfulness will have happened first, uh, leading to adultery, sexual unfaithfulness later. In other words, before the act of adultery takes place, there already will be a whole range of unfaithfulness or infidelities that have taken place between the two people. Now, in your counselling, you see, as they come, the two are focused on the sex that he had with his third party. Okay, that's the focus of their counselling. And often she'll want you as the counsellor to beat up on him, make her feel better, in order to make him feel regretful. Uh, and uh, he's going to want you to take his side and try to understand, you know, and as he rationalises it. Now, your job, remember, is to focus on the relationship. And so you're going to be uh, talking uh, to him about the history of the relationship with the third party and when those first expressions of intimacy began, because those expressions of intimacy have been taken away from this relationship and have been brought to this new relationship. Uh, for instance, um, a man with his secretary. Uh, he comes in one day and he says to his secretary, um, that's a very nice blouse you're wearing. It really fits you well, doesn't it? Now what's the problem with that comment? Is there a problem with that comment? <laughs> there is a problem with that comment. He's drawing attention to her physical appearance. He's making a comment to do with her physical, drawing attention to her physicality. Now, if he'd come in and he'd said to her, um, you've been doing very good work lately and your client called me yesterday to say how pleased he was with the way that you dealt with that account. See how different that is from saying, a comment, making a comment about her dress and her physical appearance. Now, what he's done is he's crossed a line. He's crossed a boundary. And those kind of comments should remain in the marriage relationship. Those are the sort of things that he should be saying to his wife. Um, now, once those words are spoken, it's out there. And uh, now, that may be followed up by other words down the track, either from him or from her. And so, uh, pretty soon it becomes apparent that he's not saying that to all the women in the office, he's only saying it to her. See, so something begins to develop. Something that is intimate, something that is secret, only to them. Now, that's, that's where you're coming in at. You see, he's going to be saying things like, well, what's wrong with that? It's an innocent comment. Well, uh, did he go home and tell his wife that day what he'd said to the secretary? These words of emotional intimacy or attraction are now their secret. The secret between the two of them. You see, already there's been a relationship beginning to be established that is secret. And uh, it's the secrecy that makes the relationship illicit. It's not something which can be open and seen by all and known by the guy's wife, for instance. This is the beginning of a secret relationship the spouse knows nothing of. She, she has no knowledge of the fact that he's making these comments to his secretary. Now, you see, when he makes that comment, it could be that uh, he has no intention of having sex with her when he made that comment. Uh, the comment was not an invitation to have sex with him. The comment was simply uh, a comment that illustrated the fact that he found her physically attractive, particularly when she was wearing that blouse. So what does she do? Does she wear that blouse again? Or does she determine never to wear it again in the office? You see, it's put her in a very difficult position. Now she has to figure out in her relationship with this man what to do with that comment and how to respond to it. Now, of course, she could kill it right there, or she could enter into this... Uh, uh, this word game, and and so there's a uh, a secret relationship that the spouse knows nothing of.
And the secret itself, you see, is a spur to intimacy in the new relationship. The secret itself develops an intimacy of its own. It's something that only he and I have, that special word. So next time she goes into his office, you know, to give him something, he gives her a look or, or makes a comment or something which shows that, you know, that in his mind she's kind of set apart in some way. And, and it's that... Uh, it's that secret, you see, which, which is the beginning of intimacy in the new relationship. He now has a level of intimacy with this employee that he doesn't have with anyone else in the office. So the secret is not only a spur to intimacy in the new relationship, that secret is now also becoming an obstacle to intimacy in the marriage. So now he goes back to his wife with the secret hidden in his heart. He goes back to his wife and the very fact that he has the secret, even though it's unknown to her, the very fact that he has the secret is, is going to be a block to intimacy in the relationship. Because as he's been intimate with his wife, he also knows that he has an intimate relationship at some level with another woman. It began with a word, a word that he will insist in counselling was spoken quite innocently. But nevertheless, it was a comment which uh, became a secret. A secret and began a level of intimacy um, with that woman that was unique to that woman and to no one else. <coughs> Secrets and lies will damage marital intimacy long before sex enters into the new relationship. Now, he comes back home and he's got this secret. He's got this, uh, I've built this relationship and it's not a sexual relationship at this stage other than in the words that are spoken. And she might say something to him like, um, you seem preoccupied. She notices some changes in his behavior. He notices, she notices some changes in the way he relates to her and she begins to wonder, hmm, I wonder if he's having an affair. Now, if she was to say to him, are you having an affair? He would say, of course not. You see, I have not had sexual relationships with that woman. You see, and, and deny it vehemently. But you see, there is something there that he's not acknowledging. There is a secret that he enjoys, and it, it started with words. Words that expressed a level of, of secrecy and intimacy just between the two of them. Words that, that, made, that were special just to that relationship. Now, as you're counselling with them... <coughs> Okay, they've come to you because the infidelity has occurred and they're coming to you because they want to know what to do about it. They want to know how to restore their marriage. They want to know if there's any hope for their marriage. They want to know if they should divorce. Um, <clears throat> uh, perhaps they just in just a lot of confusion and hurt and misunderstanding and they're just looking for a sense of direction. Now, <clears throat> your job is to help them restore the marriage relationship. The stronger this relationship becomes, then the, difficult is, the more difficult it's going to be for third parties to intervene. So your job is to strengthen the marriage relationship. Now how are you going to begin to do that in a situation like this? Well, first of all, you have to get him talking about all the secrets. The secrets have to be told. Not just the secret of um, when and how often they've had sex. But even before that, the secret about when and how the relationship began. The secret about those comments he made right at the very beginning about the way she looked in that blouse. Those are the secrets that have to be told. <clears throat> the power is in the secret. The power of infidelity is in the secrets. It's the secrets that destroy the marriage and it's the secrets that strengthen and enhance and promote the illicit relationship. It's the secrets. It's not necessarily uh, unbridled lust on the part of the offender, nor is it uh, scandalous behaviour on the part of the third party. All that's involved in it, but it's ultimately it's the secrets that drive it. It's the secrets that give it energy. It's the secrets that propel it forward. And the longer the secret remains untold, the greater the power to prevent the relationship being restored. So as a counsellor now, you're wanting him to tell in counselling the details of the relationship. Now, he may feel that he's told all he needs to tell to his wife before he comes, right, to the counselling. 
Oh, well, she, you know, he might say, oh, she, she knows all about it, and I need to repeat it all here. Uh, you might say to her, uh, has he, uh, is there anything you, you want to know about this? She said, no, no, I've, I've heard as much as I want to know. It's disgusting, I don't want to hear any more, it's just horrible. Now, you see, you're at an impasse. You've got no basis on which to go forward. Unless the secrets are told, the power of the secret to break the marriage remains. The only way to destroy the power of the illicit relationship is to tell the secrets that, that gave birth to that relationship and gave impetus to that relationship, gave momentum to that relationship and took it all the way, all the way to sexual intercourse. To break the power of that illicit relationship, the secrets have to be told. So you might ask him a question like, well, um, when did this relationship begin? Well, you know, my wife already knows that I had sex with her since such a date. He said, no, I'm asking you when the relationship began, not when the adultery began. And his wife pricks up her ears. Oh, you mean there's more to this than I know? More to this than I've been told? And suddenly she changes her mind. Suddenly she wants to know. And so the details start to come out, you know, when it began and how long it's been going on for. And, and, and the more he talks, the more he shares those secrets, the more devastated she becomes when she realizes that there's far more to this than just a, um, a wild flow on the spur of the moment. There was actually a relationship that was fostered and developed with a third party. All the secrets have to be told. This particular couple that I was counselling in the course of the counselling, she discovered that uh, he'd come home one day during the day with his girlfriend and they'd had sex in their marriage bed and then he'd had sex with his wife that night in the same bed. Now she never knew that. She had no idea the girlfriend had been in the house at all. It all came out as the secrets were told. Well you can imagine the effect on her. She was totally undone. She was, she was, she was so angry that she couldn't speak. She was trembling with rage and fear. Overwhelmed with anger and overwhelmed with shame and overwhelmed with not knowing what to do with that information she'd just been told. Would it have been better if she'd never known that? Would that have helped? Well here's the thing. If this relationship is going to be strengthened and developed What's the big casualty to the relationship that the infidelity has, uh, has rendered? Trust. trust has gone. How will trust be restored? You want to somehow restore trust. If you can't restore trust, you can't restore the relationship. Trust can only be restored if all the secrets are told. Trust can only be restored if she has heard everything. And on the basis of everything having been told, she says, um, uh, and he's demonstrated his um, commitment to restore the relationship by telling all the secrets. In other words, if a secret remains untold, the trust can't be restored. Some trust can be restored. Some trust can be restored, but while secrets remain untold, there will always be a, uh, a level which trust and intimacy in the relationship will go and it will stop there. Because this party here, going forward, has a secret which hasn't been told. And so in their heart, as they harbour that secret, it will be possible for that heart to be given over completely uh, to love, and love for their spouse and restoration of the relationship. The power of infidelity is in the secret. It's a secret relationship. It's a secret uh, sexual liaison. It's, it's, uh, it's a relationship that's been kept secret for as long as possible, and now the secret is out. The secret has to be told. So, in, in, uh, so there in the counselling, you see, you say to the wife, is there anything else you'd like to know? Here's your chance to ask him. See? And, 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 and as she asks him, what is she looking for? She asks him. She's looking forward to his response to see if he really is committed to restoring this relationship by being open and honest with her. And uh, quite a good uh, 
a guideline to follow is to, you know, when the counselling comes to an end, uh, that, uh, you know, and they're committed to restoring the marriage, to a, gu- a useful guideline on this whole issue is that for the next two years, uh, she can ask what any question she wants to about the details of that illicit affair, and you have to answer honestly. And at the end of two years, it's over. You know, we just, we close the page on that one. Because, you see, over the two-year period, um, suspicions are going to come, questions are going to come. She may even think of things that she wished was she, she'd brought up in the counselling. Uh, he, um, uh, this third party may still be in the office, may still be in their lives in some peripheral area, and so she's going to continue to want to ask him questions about where all that's at, and she's might, she might, uh, you know, want to say, you know, can I have a look at your cell phone and see who you've been calling? You see, that level of openness and honesty is, is a stark contrast to the secrecy that led to the infidelity and the adultery. <clears throat> so secrets and lies will damage marital intimacy long before sex enters in the new relationship. Now the thing about secrets is that in order to maintain a secret you have to tell a lie. Secrets can only be maintained as secrets if lies are told. So secrets and lies go together. So in order to hang on to that secret, you have to continue to tell a lie and live a lie. So for instance, say uh, not all the secrets are told, and the wife says, well, is there anything left for you to tell me? And he says, no, that you know, I've told you everything, but in fact he's lying. There is a secret he hasn't told her. Now, that commitment to secrets and lies, he will carry into the, into the restored relationship and... Uh, how can trust and intimacy be restored to the level that it needs to be by a couple that are fully reconciled? So, the secrets are revealed when the truth is told. So when truth replaces lies, secrets are revealed. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let us speak truthfully to one another, Ephesians 4.25, for we're members of the same body. And, and that's the commitment they're making here to put away falsehood, to put away lies, to put away secrets and speak the truth. Now, are there some truths that are better left untold? Are there some things that are better left untold for the sake of the ongoing commitment to the relationship? Jesus said the truth will set you free. (laughs) Certainly set this marriage free, won't it? But maybe there's some truths which will destroy rather than set free. That's often, you know. Well, you know, if I told her that, it would be the end of our relationship. Or he might say to you, look, can I, can I come back and have a session with you on my, on my own? Because, you know, you, this drive towards truthfulness and openness is getting him very worried. So he comes back and um, he says to you, look, <clears throat> I think I've told everything that I need to tell. I'm committed to my wife. I'm committed to, um, to breaking off this relationship. But look, there's just some things about that relationship that I know that if I told would devastate my wife and it would just make it a lot harder for us to be reconciled. You say, what are they? Bingo. See, if he can't tell you, then there's a problem. You're not a spouse. When the council relationship ends, you're going to be out of their lives. Perhaps forever. If he can't tell you, then there's a problem. So you say to him, someone, well, tell me what they are and then we'll, we'll decide together whether or not your wife needs to know. But if he won't tell you, then he's holding on to a secret his guilt, his shame, or whatever it is, is keeping that thing secret, and he won't let it be exposed. He says, for fear to upset his wife. Well, certainly it will damage the relationship. Now, as he says, so his guilt and his fear are holding on to that secret, and therefore he's telling a lie when he says to his wife, I've told you everything. So he's taking into the restored marriage a secret, a lie, guilt, and fear. See, it has to be told. It has to be told for truth to prevail, for guilt to return to, to for guilt to turn to repentance. The truth has to be told. 
confession has to be made otherwise guilt will never become repentance and shame will never become hope are there some things that she doesn't need to know well as a general rule of thumb you could say hmm sexual infidelities that occur that, that, that occurred before he ever met his wife are different from infidelities that, occur, uh, that occurred after he met his wife. The difference is that the infidelities that occurred after he met his wife are infidelities that were directly damaging to the relationship. Infidelities that might have occurred earlier on when, uh, you know that scripture that says, remember not the sins of my youth? It's a prayer to God, remember not the sins of my youth? Well, don't hold them to my charge. You see, that, here's the thing. If whatever has happened in your life if that's impacting on your current marriage relationship, then it has to be told. For instance, uh, there might have been a, a sexual encounter with someone years early, long before you met your wife, and then suddenly out of the blue this person calls you up. And now you're happily married with a bunch of children, that was long gone, this person calls you up. Now up until then it hasn't been an issue for the marriage, but now it is. Now it has to be told. So, does it have to be told? Does the secret have to be told? If it has direct impact on the marriage, yes. Anything that happens within that relationship with the spouse, either before marriage or during marriage, anything that happens during that period has a direct impact on relationship on the marriage relationship and has to be told. Uh, I was counselling a couple in the States and... Um, she was quite sure that he had been seen prostitutes. Christian couple, he had leadership responsibilities in his church and, and so did she. And, and she was quite sure he'd been seen prostitutes. And they came to see me and um, he vehemently denied it and she had all these strange evidence, strange behaviours. He'd come home late at night and she'd wake up and hear the washing machine going. He'd been washing his clothes, you see. Strange behaviour. Um, he vehemently denied it. Yet I was increasingly uncomfortable with his denials. And, uh, uh, and, and the counselling wasn't going anywhere. So finally I asked if I could see him on his own. And he came in and I said to him, uh, uh, Bill, are you being... It wasn't Bill. Bill, are you being totally honest in, this, in our counselling? Um, I, I feel, Bill, that I'm working harder than you are at restoring your marriage. And uh, uh, your wife... Is, is quite sure that you're not telling the truth. Um, Bill, can you look me in the eye right now and tell me that you are being totally truthful in everything you're saying? And he looked me in the eye and he said, yes, I can. I'm being totally truthful. And so as a counsellor, you see, you're, you're, at that point you're stymied because, you know, you can't go any further. You can't accuse him of lying. You've got no basis to accuse him of lying. And um, so we had one more session and I said to him, look, this, uh, this, this isn't working and it might be to do with my incompetence, but I can't seem to get past this, so what I'm going to do is refer you to another counsellor. Well, he, he, was, he was very angry because the agreement had made with his wife when she accused him of seeing prostitutes, well, look, we'll go to counselling and we'll get through counselling and, and if counselling, if nothing comes up in counselling, then uh, you forget about it and we'll just carry on. And so he was hanging in there, hanging fire until the six sessions were over, then he'd be scot-free. So at session five I said, look, this isn't working, I'm going to refer you to someone else. Well, he started effing me up and down and, and he was just so angry and I thought, boy, uh, I'm put, punching this guy's button where it really hurts. And so he went to another counsellor and sure enough, that counsellor was, by God's grace, able to do what I wasn't able to do and he confessed it all. He'd been seeing prostitutes. And, and, and she... When it all finally came out, she just fell off a chair. I wasn't there, but she fell off a chair and just lay on the floor screaming and wailing for about 15 minutes. You know, that she was vindicated. But the vindication was a, a bittersweet thing. She didn't want to be vindicated, but she was vindicated. So it's the secrets have to be told. The secrets have to be, The spouse knows. The secrets have to be told. Telling the secrets will begin to rebuild intimacy and trust. No intimacy without truth. No trust without intimacy. 
telling the secrets will begin to rebuild intimacy and trust. No intimacy without truth. No, no trust without intimacy. Telling the details will destroy the illicit intimacy of the extra relationship. Telling the details will destroy the illicit relationship. Telling the secrets will destroy this liaison. The reason it destroys it because you've told the secrets of the of the illicit intimacy. Once the secret of the illicit intimacy has been told, the intimacy is gone from this relationship. You've destroyed the intimacy that was there, that was built up through secrets and lies. You've destroyed that intimacy by truth-telling and the counselling. The power of the secret will be broken. Telling the secrets to the spouse, in other words confessing, will hasten repentance. Not telling adds to the, adds to the betrayal and gives life to the illicit relationship. Not telling the secret adds to the betrayal. It keeps the betrayal going. And it gives life, gives continued life to the illicit relationship. Not telling the secrets will increase the distance between sin and repentance and increase the risk of a marriage breakdown. The new relationship is an escape from the reality of the marriage. An avoiding of the lack of intimacy and the hard work required to make the marriage better. Very often the guy will say in this situation, which is the guy who's offended, well, you know, my wife wasn't sexually available to me. You know, she doesn't like sex or whatever. You see, in order to justify the illicit relationship. Well, it, maybe she wasn't sexually available to him. And that's now grist for the mill. You see, that's part of the part of the counselling. And you're going to ask questions about that and lay that open. And at the end of the day, whether his accusation was true or not, the bottom line for him is, in the light of that, in the light of his marriage being sexually unfulfilling to him, what is he going to do? Is he going to look for it in a third party, or is he going to stay with the relationship and do the hard work of building intimacy in that relationship, intimacy that will lead to sexual fulfilment? That's the question for him. The new relationship is an escape from remaining at the coalface of a difficult marriage. It's an escape from, from staying with the hard work, the bruising work of staying with a marriage that isn't working well. Now, as a counsellor, what you're saying to this couple is it's worth it to stay at the coalface. It's worth it to labour at a marriage that isn't working. Because um, with mutual commitment, you can make this a marriage relationship which will sing. Now, this new relationship is an escape from the reality, is avoiding the lack of intimacy and the hard work required. And, uh, and you, a new relationship is only new once, isn't it? A new relationship is only new once. Then after that it becomes an old relationship. And, and all the reasons for avoiding or backing away from relationship here, you're going to bring into this relationship here. So say, you know, say there is a divorce, and this one goes, and this one comes in a, in a place. All the reasons that made this relationship difficult will be there to make this relationship difficult, the new one. A new relationship is only new once, and then it becomes an old relationship, and all the old issues are still there. It's far better to stay at the cold face and deal with the difficult relationships that are making this marriage a difficult one to remain in. Stay with that in order to build a marriage which um, will honour God and develop a growing intimacy and trust. Uh, in very few cases does repentance over the failure of the first marriage characterise the second marriage. Now, this last little paragraph here concerns a situation where you're counselling a couple, one of whom, or perhaps both of whom, um, had been married before, and now you're counselling a couple who are, are on their second wife or husband. Well, both of them might be on their second spouses. Now, as you... Um, and they've come to you for couple counselling, you see, and, and as you talk you realise that the wife's been married before, the husband's been married before, and, and there's been a divorce and now they're married, see, to each other. And, um, and, and, and you're wanting to go back and ask questions about the failed marriage. 
And they're uncomfortable with that. Because, you see, in their minds, the failed marriage has nothing to do with the current marriage. See, that's gone. Divorce has removed that out of my life. Well, here's the thing. If the second marriage is going to be better than the first marriage, the second marriage has to be characterized by a level of honesty and truth that exceeds that which was characteristic of the first marriage. So the reason you're asking questions about the first marriage is to try to pinpoint whether any issues of secrets and lies in the first marriage have carried over into the second marriage. And, and one way to, uh, 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 particularly if, you, if you're working with Christians, is to ask them uh, what's their current relationship with their former spouse. Let's assume they're all Christians. What's your current relationship with your former spouse? Well, we just don't even talk. It's just a toxic relationship. Well, there's unresolved stuff there. Now, you, you're not going to advocate that this couple is standing in front of you divorce so he can go back and, you know, because God hates divorce, we don't want to encourage more divorce. But certainly, unless there is a reconciliation with the first spouse at some level, that lack of reconciliation, that toxicity, that, that, that anger, that hatred, or that division, whatever it is, will be, will be to some extent a feature of the second marriage. So with the second marriage, what you're looking for is repentance over the failure of the first marriage by the spouse that's been married before. That repentance over their contribution to the failure of the first marriage. You see what you're doing? What you're doing is you're setting up, you're setting up a, um, uh, a relational dynamic of repentance that if there's been no repentance over the first marriage breakdown, then what they've brought into the marriage is a resistance to acknowledging their sin and a, a resistance to repenting over their sin or their contribution to the breakdown of the first marriage. And that resistance to repenting is now going to get in the way of developing intimacy in the second marriage. You see that? So you're using the, the first marriage, the broken marriage, as a way of illustrating, engaging, and helping the couple to understand just how healthy can this second marriage be in the light of the first marriage breakdown. Now, if the spouse has come out of the broken marriage with a true repentance, with a true brokenness, with a true commitment before God, biblically divorced, then uh, the second marriage can be absolutely wonderful. When changes are made to save the second marriage, spouses often realize they could have saved the first marriage and not lost their children, their wealth, etc. So you, the marriage that broke may never have been, uh, may have, might never have gone to counseling. They have come to counseling when they're faced with the breakdown of a second marriage. My second marriage is about to go south. So we'll be going to get some counselling this time. We never got it last time. And as you work with them on the relationship and they begin to realise the, the wonderful, liberating and, and life-changing effects of telling secrets, of making changes, they begin to realise, look, with this kind of help, I could have saved my first marriage. That divorce was, was unnecessary. So they're learning things about their own patterns of behaviour. Now... Um, Frank Pittman's taken a, a done a lot of work on um, on this question, so we're just going to look uh, before we break at what he has, has to say. Now he's taken uh, infidelity and he's um, uh, seen four patterns of infidelity. There's accidental infidelity. Now remember, this is. Um, there's a non-Christian try to under, trying to understand how and why infidelity happens in marriage. Accidental infidelity, it seemingly just happens. It got drunk, I didn't know what I was doing, I was at a convention, the work buddy sent a girl into my room, that kind of thing. Questions remain, e.g. how is it that the values and the boundaries are so easily violated? Why is this individual so accident prone? Why does this seem to happen to them repeatedly, or more than once? Accidental infidelity. This is the... Um, uh, we're going to talk in a minute about how to respond to each one. But second one is marital arrangements. This is where uh, couples agree on having other sex partners. You're probably unlikely to encounter that in a Christian context. Uh, philandering. This is where... Um, so uh, often happens when, 
when uh, the guy is very flirtatious or the woman is very flirtatious and the other spouse is very concerned that this flirtatious behavior will end up leading them into infidelity. Predominantly a male pattern in which men are proving their manhood. They're, this is more for the audience, the other guys, than anything else. Little interest in sex or the woman. These men may be protecting themselves from intimacy. Um, predominantly male pattern. Um, it's not restricted to men. Uh, women uh, can and are flirtatious with other men, married women. And um, the thing to remember about uh, flirtatious behaviour or philandering is that mostly it's not about a desire to have sex with the person they're flirting with. That's not what it's about. It's about them trying to prove something to themselves or to prove something to the to those around them, or it may even be a way of trying to punish their spouse, particular party or something, embarrass the spouse. Um, it may be that they're um, using this this as a as um, because in terms of sexual behaviour, this is as far as they ever want to go in any relationship, including the marriage relationship. Uh, or romantic. Now, romantic is where you the kind of infidelity we've been talking about this evening, where a relationship begins through intimate words spoken and secrets develop and ultimately resulting in adultery. Pittman calls this a form of temporary insanity. Uh, the reason he calls it an insanity is because he's basically asking the question, why would someone want to break up a good marriage, it may not be perfect, but why would someone want to break up a good marriage by getting involved with someone where there's no prospect of any long-term satisfactory relationship. It's a temporary insanity. Well, if he understood the heart of man as the Bible talks about the heart of man, it wouldn't be such a mystery. This most common pattern includes an assumption that this new person will make reality go away. Contrary to the thinking of the one involved, it occurs not when the perfect person is found, but when a crisis, but at a crisis point in people's lives. Now we've been talking about transition and crisis and in a transition, say in a marriage, when transition comes and it provo uh, provokes a crisis, often that crisis can be what launches uh, one of the partners into an illicit relationship. In other words, you see what he's saying is that this, this, uh, this relationship here may not have had anything to do with this one here but rather it might have been this person's response to a crisis they're experiencing in transition. The crisis that generates this insanity may be the difficulties in the marriage, including the normal developmental transitions that must be faced in normal marriage, e.g. around the death of a parent, the birth of a child. The romantic pattern is truly an escape. Uh, some men will complain that after the birth of our first child, my wife gave all attention to the child, and uh, what he's basically saying is he felt left out. And so he, um, that's what prompted the illicit affair. Well, let's say that's the man unable to handle the transition into parenthood um, without a crisis developing, which he then seeks to uh, deal with in his own way in what turns out to be an illicit relationship. Each pattern of infidelity requires a different response from the counsellor. The accidental infidelity work to get it out in the open. Keeping it secret only creates distance. See? Telling the secret. Yes, trust is violated, but the distance will be more destructive than the damage to the trust. Uh, the distance created by the secret will be more destructive than damage to the trust. In other words, if you tell the secret, trust will be damaged. But if you don't tell the secret, the distance the secret creates in the marriage will be more damaging to the marriage than any hurt to trust by telling the secret. Marital arrangements. These are peculiar people and peculiar relationships work to make the situation overt. Through strengthening the marriage, the arrangement can become uh, an option of less viability. Work with this type will require great patience because they're both committed to it. Uh, philandering, this is the flirtatious behavior. When working with one of these men, don't neglect to explore his relationship with his father. Focus on where he learned to be a man. In other words, uh, does this guy feel most like a man when he's um, 
when he's being flirtatious with other women? Is this, is this when he feels like being a man? And, and so questions about his relationship with his own father. Where did he learn to be a man? What was his model of manhood that was given to him by his father? Uh, um, if it's a woman who's involved in flirtatious relationships, um, it's, uh, it's probably more a question of asking about uh, the history of her sexual encounters, particularly as a child. If there's been sexual abuse... Uh, with the with the girl when she was very young, then as she comes into adulthood, there's going to be a level of sexual dysfunction there for her. She's going to be um, uh, because her boundaries has been so badly violated. She will be very uncertain and unsure how to behave with other men, in in any kind of environment, and um, uh, and she may resort to flirtatious behaviour to cover that over. Uh, romantic. These are the toughest situations because of the insanity. The spouse's anger doesn't help much, so help them to control their expression of it. That's the offended spouse he's talking about. Keep them rooted in reality. Uh, so this guy here might say, well, I'm in love with this, third, with this other woman. I'm in love. Um, and so this, the council responds, well, people on crisis often feel that way, but you'll get over it. So he's taking a kind of a a tough approach to this guy who makes that comment. Um, uh, women are tougher, Pittman says, because they trust their feelings more. In other words, he's saying, in his opinion, that women are less likely to form an illicit relationship because they, they uh, are more aware of their feelings and they know where their feelings are going, whereas a man just kind of... He might, the man might say, um, I didn't know what I was thinking. Well, that's the truth. He wasn't thinking at all. You see, in other words, he was just acting impulsively on what he saw, what he believed was there available for him. Pittman is saying that with women, uh, they tend to uh, be more aware of their emotions, more aware of the consequences of their emotions, more aware to trust their emotions rather than disregard them or ignore them. Now, of course, that's a generalisation. Um, uh, women commit adultery as much as men do. You just go over the page, it's summarised for you on a little diagram here. Infidelity types and counsellor goals and responses. The accidental infidelity, the client's uh, response, oops, how did this happen? The counsellor's goal is to expose the facts, in other words, tell all the secrets. Uh, destroy the power of the secret and begin to repair the marriage. The process is to provide support to the marriage as it seeks to be restored and and to help them to put in boundary checks, particularly uh, for this man here, he has to put in boundaries to ensure that that kind of uh, those kind of secrets don't occur again. Those kind of uh, intimate liaisons don't occur again at the level of words, and to be accountable to his wife. Um, so, for instance, he might come home one day, this is after the marriage and the process of being restored, and he might say to his wife, uh, a new secretary started at work today, and, and uh, you know, boy, she's a real temptation. And so he's been honest with his wife, and so they can talk about what he should do about that. Um, in other words, you see, there, there, there's a level of honesty and openness and communication. The desired result is prevention, prevention of these things happening again, increased carefulness. Let's drop down to the philander or the flirtatious person. The client, if it's a man, might say, you know, uh, real men do it more, or in other words, it's something to do with his expression or understanding of manhood. Uh, the counsellor's goal is to, to, for this person to stop avoiding intimacy in their marriage. They're backing away from intimacy and seeking a false intimacy in their flirtatious behaviour because a real intimacy is too difficult, it's too challenging. Explore the relationship with the father, question their fear of women, um, desired result, pursuit of true intimacy with wife only. Romantic relationship, this is a, uh, an illicit relationship of some duration. The client um, has decided that this new relationship is with someone who is perfect or makes up for all the defects they have, that they see in their spouse. Expose the false expectations, uh, you know, they're only, they're only perfect. As the relationship is new, you get into the relationship, you'll find that they're less than perfect. Uh, false expectations expose the feelings as escape. What are they escaping from? What is it in the marriage they're trying to avoid, they're escaping from, they're backing away from, that they're unhappy about? Um, the counsellor's process is um, 
to uh, uh, stay rooted in the reality that in fact there is no perfection, there is no escape, there is no fantasy. Okay, so just before we um, just before we stop after the break, we're going to look at divorce over the page. Uh, but just before we go there, is there anything you'd like to say about infidelity? What we've been saying about infidelity. just a, a temporary insanity as Pittman would call it but uh, yeah. so things might be fine here so the reason the explanation for this isn't to be found in problems with the marriage yeah so then it must be found elsewhere there must be a reason for it so there's always a reason yeah just... yeah but it could be it's found apart from right. yes uh, now you see he may claim, look, this has nothing to do with the marriage, it's a great marriage. You know, I love my wife, I've never stopped loving my wife. This is not my wife, about my wife. It's not about the relationship, it's just, it's just, you know, and he just, he's struggling to explain what it was. Now, your job is to unpack that and to help, to help him understand and to, uh, to gain some insight is into, into what caused him to do that. There was a reason for it. He needs to know. She's intrigued. She wants to know. And, and as, the, as the reasons come out, as the reasons come out, you will find that those reasons will have some kind of impact on the relationship, which either of them may have been unaware of. And, 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 and certainly if this relationship had continued, then the impact on the, on the marriage would have been significant. So I would take that at face value and see that as grist for the mill and work with that, keep it client-centered. Um, but always in the back of your mind is uh, uh, what impact does this have on the relationship? Now the client is assisting, doesn't have any impact on the relationship. Um, but you just need to test that by asking questions and exploring further. Okay, anything else? Um. <coughs> Yeah, this regarding like temptations and that. Although the, I meet with some guys for breakfast once a week, and part of that is just being honest with each other. Like one of them said a few weeks ago, they said, "Oh, like summer's coming, the skits are getting shorter, and it's just you know too much." But you know, it's good to have guys to be accountable to. But a, part of me is like, yeah. Does, you, does it really help your wife if you're telling her every single thing every day that, you know, you saw someone down the street and that, you know, but she hadn't seen her and, and you know, all that kind of is just like, if you told your wife every time you attempted to take a second look, I don't know. But if, you know, it's not a secret if you're telling someone else that he holds you accountable. Definitely something to tell your wife about. Like if, it, if you met, say, you know, an ex-girlfriend from way back or something, I think you want to get it straight out there, so she knows. So there is no sort of wondering if you, you know, could do anything because you can't because you hold it. So yeah, instead, sort of having mentors that help you with that male one. Um, one question to ask um, are these temptations having an effect on my marriage now that's a difficult question for a guy to answer honestly um, but if he is able to answer it honestly and if he is coming up with an answer that says well yes it is then it needs to be told the other comment I'd make too is that 
In a marriage where there's been um, trust and intimacy developed over um, a long period of time, uh, where there's a strong Christian maturity on both, um, the expectation is that the temptations are not going to come as regularly as oft- or as often. Uh, but when they do come, um, it may be that the marriage is strong enough to, to bear that disclosure. Okay, anything else? Alright, well let's take a uh, 10 minute break and we'll come back and talk about divorce. How to deal with divorce as counsellors, as uh, in pastoral counselling. The Bible allows for divorce in cases of sexual unfaithfulness and abandonment, but it does not require divorce. Uh, bear, in, bear in mind that divorce is like suicide. It intensifies the pain and spreads it to others. Divorce is like putting a gun to the head of a marriage and pulling the trigger. And the mess is everyone else's to clean up. Just let me tease out that analogy analogy a little bit more. With suicide, the issues of struggle are with the person who's having the ideations of self-harm. When they commit suicide, everything they were struggling with, the pain that they were struggling with, is now a pain that has spread to others. Not only has it spread to others, but now it's unresolvable because the person is gone. Divorce is like that. Divorce is no less intense. Before a couple divorce, the, the problems, the difficulties in their marriage are contained between the two of them. Once they divorce, all their issues and struggles and pain and grief are now exploded out to children, families of origin, relatives, close friends. They're now all being splattered with that couple's marital problems. Not only that, it's unresolvable. Because the marriage has ended in divorce, it is unresolvable. So they're all left with the tragic consequences of That couple's broken relationship and those tragic consequences are with them for the rest of their lives because it's unresolvable. It intensifies the the pain and spreads it to others. Divorce punishes everyone for the offences the spouses have committed to each other. Everyone is punished for the couple's inability to make their marriage work. Now, I I say this right at the beginning because our job is to prevent divorce. As we step into the grief that is a conflicted marriage, our purpose is to help that marriage grow strong, to help that marriage resolve its conflicts and grow strong and be a marriage that honours Christ and benefits the the spouse, uh, the the couple and their children. There's good reason why... um, the Bible does not allow divorce, apart from those two exceptions. Uh, No-fault no divorce, which uh, began under Ronald Reagan's governorship in California in 1969 and spread like wildfire to the whole of the Western world, no-fault divorce is not a biblical concept of divorce. Uh, while adultery is a great hurt, divorce compounds this great hurt by adding still another great hurt. It's better to work through the resolvable hurt of adultery than to be faced with the irresolvable hurt of a divorce. Now we're thinking here about a, about a couple who come to you and adultery has taken place and, and they're saying to you, I don't know how our marriage could ever recover from this, I don't know how it's ever going to be resolved, how can I ever trust them again? And uh, um, you know, I just want to walk away from him, I just want to give up on this, he's just been, etc, etc, etc. 
She's trying to grapple with the hurt of the adultery. Now, the way to resolve the hurt of adultery is not to divorce. That doesn't resolve the hurt. What's more, it spreads the hurt to others. What's more, now the hurt is unresolvable and is there with this woman for the rest of her life. Keep the marriage together. You keep the hurt contained. You, you, by keeping the marriage together, you have the opportunity to resolve the hurt, restore the marriage, testify to the goodness of God. That's why the scriptures don't require divorce, only allow divorce in the case of adultery. The far better way is for that marriage to be reconciled and you, by God's grace, are the ones for a brief period of time labouring at the cold face of that shattered marriage along with those two, the husband and wife, to leave their marriage in a better place than when they came to you. So that divorce as an option begins to recede. And what takes its place is a growing hope that in spite of what has happened, this marriage can succeed. A couple came to me. Um, she had uh, caught him watching pornography and, uh, and the only way she could get him to stop was to threaten to divorce if he continued. Well, he continued and so <laughs> he came to see me and he had to stop watching pornography and she had to stop threatening him with divorce. Those kind of ultimatums don't work. That's not a solution. Now, understandable, in her frustration, her hurt, her bewilderment, her guilt, her shame, her uncertainty, her not knowing, it seemed like the easy way out. Far better, far better the, to, to resolve the issues within the marriage that led rise to the behaviour so that not only is trust renewed, but you see trust is strengthened. Because now the trust is built on the mutual experience of together going through the very hard work of confession and repentance and forgiveness being sought and forgiveness being granted and a reconciliation. All that is a wonderful healing experience in and of itself and gives them much hope for the marriage. Now that's your job, to take them from the brink of divorce and turn them around <laughs> and set them going in the direction of a God honouring marriage. It's better to work through the resolvable hurt of the adultery than to be faced with the irresolvable hurt of a divorce. Always give hope that the marriage can be restored, even in the face of adultery. Separation inevitably leads to divorce rather than reconciliation. Now, sometimes the couple will come to you and say, well, what about we just separate? We're not going to divorce. Let's say we just separate in order um, to give ourselves space, to just get our heads back around where it ought to be. Um, never encourage that, unless there's a, th a threat of harm, obviously, harm and abuse. But otherwise, never encourage separation as a way of dealing with marriage issues. The only way a marriage issue can be resolved is if they stay together under the one roof. Move into separate bedrooms if you have to, but stay together in the house so that together we can begin to work on the issues. Otherwise, what happens if they're separated? The only time they're together is, with, is when they're with you in the counselling room. Now, they may be talking about kids and all that if they're living apart, but the only time they're actually together and talking is when they're with you. And so how can the counselling go anywhere? Because how can they make any application to anything that happens in the counselling if they, when they go out of the counselling they get in two different cars and go in two different directions? See, it's never going to work. You'll be working harder than they are trying to reconcile the marriage. And it's not your marriage that's broken. So, um, separation inevitably leads to divorce rather than reconciliation. Now what happens with separation is they get a temporary relief from the hurt, the grief, the pain and the anguish of being together under the same roof. They get a temporary relief from that. And, and you know, if it's, a, if it's a situation like this, you know, and this, this, this illicit relationship has been discovered and there they are and, and, they're, um, and, and so they separate and, and, and as the separation goes on, she's beginning to enjoy this. 
been free of this hurt and of this, of this idiot husband of hers and his temporary insanity. Why did he go and do that? You see, and, and the longer that they stay separated, the longer she begins to enjoy the idea of the fact that, that uh, uh, I'm away or he's away, he's been out of the house and, and I'm here with the kids and everything's uh, peaceful and I'm not stressed, I'm not dealing with the hurt and the anger and the grief and he comes and he goes, he takes the come and takes the kid and he goes and he comes back off the kid off and goes and, and you see she's beginning to like that. Now you talk to them about, well let's, let's get reconciled, let's get back together again and she says, well, let's just wait a bit longer. Here's what I do. If a couple come to me wanting couple counselling and they're separated, I'll say to them, um, I'll agree to the counselling if you get back together in the same house. We are committed to making this marriage work. We're not committed to coming up with reasons why you should stay separated. Now, you know, there's always exceptions, aren't there? You probably know of cases, I know of cases where people have separated for a while and come back and made the marriage work. Okay, so, of course, that's out there. But generally speaking, um, don't see separation as something that is a way to, uh, to help people resolve their relational difficulties. Keep the couple together, unless there's the threat of harm, and help them to work on restoring intimacy to the marriage. Um, and they can't restore intimacy to the marriage if they're separated. Now, by restoring intimacy to the marriage, I'm not talking about sex there at that point. Now, sexual intimacy, of course, is a, is, a, is a large part of intimacy in a marriage. But you see, intimacy in a marriage begins with emotional intimacy. Emotional intimacy which, which um, results in, culminates in sexual intimacy. The reason you want them to, to come back together is not so that they can start having sex again and thus restore the marriage. That's not going to do it. You can't restore a marriage based on sex. On sex. What, you, what you want them to do is to begin to, st to, to restore emotional intimacy in the relationship. And the emotional intimacy comes when he tells secrets, where she's able to ask questions and he's being honest. That can only happen if they're together. Um, you want to restore the intimacy. They have to be together for that. If the offending party wants to stay in the marriage... This, this bloke here, in our, in our case tonight, if the offending party wants to stay in their marriage, then help them both to be reconciled on the basis of the gospel dynamics of confession, repentance and forgiveness. The rebuilding of the marriage, intimacy and trust, may take time, but gospel-based reconciliation is a necessary first step in the restoration process. Now, you won't find that in the secular literature. But nevertheless... It's the only God-given way of healing when there's been adultery. The only God-given way of restoring a marriage in the event of adultery is the gospel. Uh, so sometimes when a marriage comes to me and it's, it's, it's severely conflicted and they're on the brink of a divorce, um, uh, Rather than uh, six weekly sessions of an hour, hour and a half each, I'll suggest that what say we, we spend a day or two together and we'll just give ourselves the whole day, maybe two whole days, and we'll just uh, we'll try to understand what's going on in this marriage and what's causing all this grief and, and conflict and um, infidelity. Uh, you know, just in order to... And see, over those two days, you, you, you cover as much ground as you might cover in a month of weekly counselling. And, and you get the marriage now, you've pulled it back from the brink. You see they're at the brink with one foot over and dangling. You see, you've pulled them back a few steps away from the brink after a, uh, two days maybe intensive. And now, now you know, the weekly counselling will, will be sufficient. See, it's a commitment to the marriage. If divorce does happen, uh, then work for a reconciliation at a brother and sister level with the former spouse. Not only will this help the children, but it will bring glory to God in a situation where Satan has had a field day. Our Christians do divorce. And it's testimony to Satan's power and influence in their lives that they have divorced. Now, if, if the person comes to you and they've, the divorce has happened, and they're either in another marriage relationship or they're not, you're counseling them as a couple or single person, and the divorce has happened, and their former spouse has gone off and married someone else, they're all Christians. Well, they're still brothers and sisters in Christ. 
and they still have to be reconciled over the hurt and the grief they've caused one another. Uh, we knew this missionary couple, we knew them very well, and um, they uh, one day I got an email from him to say that his wife was uh, having a, uh, uh, an affair with another bloke. And he asked me what I should do about it. So I said, well, you have to um, woo her back like Hosea. Go after her and woo her back. Well, I'm not sure if he, if he did that or not, but uh, she left him soon after that and, um, um, uh, and, and went and lived with this other guy. She didn't marry him, just went and lived with him. And within um, a month, he was married to someone else. He just, he was so angry and in his anger and I'm going to make you pay and I'm going to make you see he's feeling rejected and all the rest of it, all that manhood issues, the way to get his manhood back, yada, yada, yada. So he <laughs> goes and marries another woman, which is fine. She was a widower, Christian lady. And, um, and so it wasn't long, about six months, they both realised they made a dreadful mistake. It's not that his marriage was an unhappy marriage. It was, it was okay. It was... <laughs> Pretty much like the first marriage, because, you know, he was in it. <laughs> so why wouldn't it be like the first marriage, you see? Uh, but she was in a situation where the guy refused to marry her, and, and, and he wasn't being very nice to her. And um, uh, so she called him up one day, and she said, well, we were, you know, they were talking to us all through this time, and we encouraged, you know, him to be reconciled. She calls him up one day, and she said, look, um, I made a dreadful mistake from leaving. I wish I'd never had. I wish we were still together. And he said, well, um, I would be great if we were still together. I never wanted you to leave in the first place, but I'm married now, so, you know. And, and the realisation was that if he just waited six months, you know, she could have left that guy and their marriage could have been restored. So they, they lived in different cities with their spouses, spouse, partners agreement. They met and had coffee and confessed their sin to one another and were reconciled as a brother and sister in Christ. Now that's pretty rare. <laughs> the reason it's so rare is because divorce is like suicide and, and um, divorce leaves all the issues unresolved so how can you be reconciled with someone when all the issues are still unresolved see that's the difficulty of divorce so you want to get two people who have been divorced from each other to be reconciled they, 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 they can't be reconciled over the hurt because they're no longer together what they can be do, reconciled over is it, it was wrong for us to divorce we should have stayed together and worked out our issues Children do not benefit from a divorce. Uh, divorce for the sake of the children is not a valid reason or excuse. By all means, separate the children from abuse. Children would prefer their parents to stay together regardless. Fighting parents is still better than no parents at all. Indeed, many parents who are trapped in unhappy marriages would be surprised to learn that their children are relatively content. The children aren't worried that their parents sleep in separate beds. The parents might be worried about that, but the kids aren't. They're happy their parents are just there. Now, that uh, sentence in italics is a quote from this book here. And uh, you see at the end of the next paragraph, we've got the book uh, there for you. Uh, the Unexpected Legacy of Divorce, a 25-year landmark study. Uh, now, the three authors are all unbelievers. This is a secular study over 25 years looking at the effects of divorce upon children. And that was published in 2000. Now, you'll appreciate that since no-fault no divorce in, in the early 70s, we have the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, we have 30 years of, uh, of, of divorce uh, at an increasing rate within our society, Western society. It was just like it opened the floodgates, that legislation of no-fault divorce. And, and at the time, the prevailing myth was that children will be better off if, uh, if, if they're no longer in an environment where parents are fighting. And that was the prevailing myth for 30 years. Now, what these people did over a 25-year period 
Um, soon after No Fault Divorce came in, they began this landmark study and they followed the lives of the children of divorced parents when they were very young and they interviewed them every 10 years. They sat down and had a conversation with them. And, and they plotted, uh, plotted their progress through childhood, through adolescent, into adulthood, and into adult relationships. And the conclusion they came to was that divorce has a devastating long-term effect on children. These are secularists saying this. One hour. No surprise to us. The Bible, for good reason, doesn't allow divorce. Um, or doesn't encourage divorce. There's always a better way. And this is a quote from their book. Indeed, many parents who are trapped in unhappy marriages would be surprised to learn that their children are relatively content. And so they'd be interviewing, say, um, a 10-year-old child whose parents have just recently divorced, and they say to the child, uh, what was things like at home? And the child will say things were like, Oh, yeah, mum and dad, uh, you know, squabble and fall, but it was fine. Now, see, the child has grown up in that environment and doesn't think it's anything very unusual. And uh, the child was devastated when the parents divorced. The parents were delighted with the divorce. The child was devastated with the divorce. Uh, divorce loses children of their home. Now, in a divorce, children not only lose their parents, they lose their home. Now, immediately you see the rejoiner is, but they don't lose their parents. Their parents still love them. The parents are involved in their lives. That's not how the children see it. The children see it as they've lost the home that they had. And they've lost dad to his new girlfriend. See, there's been a loss. There's been a parental loss. There's been a loss at a home level. Their home is gone. They lose their exclusive relationship with their parents. You see, before the divorce, the children had their parents all to themselves. After the divorce, particularly if there's new relationships formed, the, parents, the children have to share their parents with others. They're expected also to receive and relate to the new parents while sharing them with their biological parents. Dad may have been developing his relationship with his girlfriend for some time, but the children, sorry, the children only learn of her when the parents separate. You see what it is? Dad's been developing his relationship with this person here for a long period of time and Dad has got to the point where he believes this woman is wonderful and she'd be a wonderful mother to his children and so to swap her for his wife, for him, is, uh, is not that big a deal. And so he brings her into to his children and she says, he says to them, um, this is Sally, she's your new mother, she's a wonderful woman, I love her very much, she loves me very much, she loves you very much and, and, uh, and, and she's going to be a wonderful mother. And the children are saying, who is Sally? Who is Sally? See the secret? The relationship with Sally has been a secret up until this point. Now the secret is out, and Dad wants everyone to accept Sally the way he accepts Sally. Because he spent, what, a long period of time getting to know Sally. But she's a total stranger to her children. What are the children saying? I've already got a mother. Who's the strange woman? Is she the woman that broke up our parents' marriage? You see, to them she's a stranger, she's the cause for the parents' breakup. The repercussions on children are serious and long-lasting and are not to be un underestimated. I'm just going to read a little bit from this book uh, for you. In the fall of 1994, I received a phone call that was to entirely revise my understanding of divorce and how it has changed the nature of American society. On the other end of the line was Karen James, one of the children in the longitudinal study on divorce that I began in 1971 and last wrote about it in the late 1980s. I remembered her well. Karen was a charming, lively child who was 10 years old when her parents separated. I had interviewed her then and again when she was 15, 20 and 25 years old. The last time we met she was miserable, living with a man she didn't love. I recalled how concerned I was about her despair. But the voice on the phone sounded strong and, and vibrant. This is Karen James, she announced. I'm calling from North Carolina. How are you? After exchange routine pleasantry, she said, I'm going to be in the Bay Area next week. Do you have time to see me? Of course, I answered. I've thought about you many times. I'm in a whole other place since our last meeting, said Karen. It's all new, but I'm coming to town to get married next Saturday, but I can come up to Marin, must be the suburb where she lives, on Thursday afternoon. Would that work? I told Karen that I was honoured that she could fit me in during such a busy week, and we set, uh, we set a time to get together. I was absolutely delighted by her call. 
Karen is one of the many children who, after divorce, moved into the vacuum created by parents who are overwhelmed by the changes in their lives and unable to carry on as they had before. Divorce is so disruptive to the lives of the parents, and then after the divorce, beginning to restructure their lives as single people or restructure their lives into a new relationship, it leaves a huge vacuum into which the children fall. Divorce often leads to a partial or complete collapse in the adult's ability to parent for months and sometimes years after the breakup. Caught up in rebuilding their own lives, mothers and fathers are preoccupied with a thousand and one concerns which can blind them to the needs of their children. In many such families, one child, often the oldest child, takes on responsibilities far beyond anything she has done before. These young caregivers quietly assume the nurturing and moral guidance of their younger siblings and also serve as constant advisor, caregiver and even parent for their own parents during the years that follow. So... If he divorces his wife and takes off and forms a new relationship with this girl here and, and this woman is now on her own with the children, what this research has shown is the oldest child becomes the parent and this one becomes the child because their life has been so devastated. Karen followed the script of the letter. From a merry, outgoing ten-year-old, she soon, be, soon became a somber young woman. I remember her telling me when she was only eleven, I'm really worried about my brother and sister. I have to set them a good example so they'll be good. That means I have to be good. They fight all the time since my parents broke up. I try to stop that and teach them to talk instead of hitting. I'm also worried about my mum. Since Dad left, she cries every day when she comes home from work. I try to comfort her and also warn her about her new boyfriend. I think that he'll hurt her feelings even more. That's an eleven-year-old talking. Look at all that responsibility she's taken on board. Karen shook her head sadly. She was overburdened by her new responsibilities but felt she had no choice but to forfeit her needs to the needs of her family. High school, she explained, at our meeting several years later, was a blur because the home situation hardly changed. At our last meeting when she was 25, I was very concerned about Karen's inability to break free from a young man she was living with but did not love. She tried to explain. You remember that when I was dating guys in college, I became very frightened that anyone I really liked would abandon me or be unfaithful, and that I would end up suffering like my mother and father. Well, choosing Nick was safe because he had no education and no plans, which means that he'll always have fewer choices than me. I knew that if we lived together and maybe got married someday, I wouldn't ever have to worry about him walking out. With tears in her eyes, she added, Nick is very kind and caring. I'm not used to that. When months, within months of our last meeting, she had moved out of the apartment she shared with Nick and said goodbye. As she had anticipated, he was devastated, begged her to come back, wailed, and made her feel guiltier than ever. Since she was 11 years of, old, 11 years of age, this, this young lady had taken upon herself the responsibility to keep other people's lives intact. How were you able to leave, I asked, aware of her long-standing difficulty in turning away someone who needed her care? She was silent, then answered slowly, her face pale. I felt like I was dying. It has to be the hardest thing I've ever done, and I took all my courage. She described how she would come home after work and find her partner lying on the couch waiting for her to take charge. It was just like caring for mum. She swapped her mother for a very dependent individual. So Karen came and visited. After Karen left, I sat for a long time thinking about the unexpected twists and turns of her life. Did her parents have any idea of what they started 25 years ago when they filed to divorce when Karen was 10 years, of old, 10 years of age? If they had known the long-term consequences for their children, would they have done things differently? Would they have divorced? Like most people back then, they probably never thought divorce... Sorry. Like most people back then, they probably thought divorce was a minor upheaval in the lives of children. They undoubtedly expected that family life would soon resume its normal course and that parents and children alike would benefit from the end to marital conflict. Surely they did not foresee lasting effects that would extend into the fourth decade of Karen's life. At 40 years of age, she was still working out the effects of her parents' divorce. I thought back on that lovely, wistful child who had tenderly taken care of her distraught mother, younger siblings and father when he became a basket case and how she had forfeited her own teenage years. I could see her face contorted with grief when in her early twenties she told me how she anguished over whether to leave the young man she had committed to simply because he had been kind to her, preoccupied with fears of loss, betrayal 
and abandonment, she was still locked into the self-sacrificial caregiver role of her childhood and had reinstalled it in her adult relationships with men. Why did she fear loss, betrayal and abandonment so strongly? Because when she was a child, she had all that inflicted upon her and she was absolutely powerless to stop it as a 10 year old. How can a 10 year old influence what her parents do? It had been imposed upon her. And now she was committed to find a relationship which that would never happen again. So when I'm talking to a couple and uh, they're talking about divorce or they're talking about their conflicted relationship, I, I spend a bit of time talking with them about the effects on their children if that divorce goes ahead. I might say to the father something like, well look, if you leave this if you, if you leave this marriage, if you don't stop this illicit affair and this marriage breaks up, um, some other man will be tucking your children in bed at night and kissing them goodnight. So that some other man is going to be raising your children and you'll be on the periphery looking in. You see, there's... there's um, why are so many young people in our society unable to commit themselves to a long-term relationship? Well, this study shows that uh, often it's the legacy of divorce. Just a couple of comments here about um, if a divorce has happened and taken place and, uh, and say this woman is left with her children, uh, as part of her dealing with what's happened is... Uh, you know, to criticise her husband to her children. Now, why does she do that? Because the divorce has made it impossible for the hurts to be resolved. It's made it impossible for the issues to be resolved. So what does the woman do with that issue, those issues? Well, she's got to talk about them to somebody. So she talks them about them to her children. How does she talk about them to her children? By laying all the blame on their father. Now, the child has just seen the father walk out of the house. The child is wondering if she's ever going to see her father again. She's wondering if the father's ever going to be involved in her life. And if that's not... If that's not stress enough, she's now been told by her mother what a dreadful person her father is. You see what you're doing? You're just, you're just heaping hurt upon hurt. And, and that child's having to carry a weight of grief which God never intended for her to bear. For the parent to criticise the other parent to the child is an assault on the child's heart. They have their own special place in their hearts for their mother and father, regardless of how the former spouse now regards that parent. So, you know, this woman may hate this man, but the child still loves their father. By God's grace, the second marriage can work well. Uh, all of life is redeemable. The second marriage can often work because the expectations are not as high as they were for the first marriage. One healthy indicator is the ability in the second marriage to recognize the anniversaries of the first marriage. So in the second marriage, can uh, uh, is, is the spouse okay with the other spouse sending a, um, a birthday card to their former spouse on their birthday? Have they been reconciled in Christ to that extent? Okay. Um, any questions about divorce? Any comments you'd like to make about divorce? Hello. You look like you belong somewhere. There we go. Out you go. There we go. Any comments about divorce? Would you just would you say that some couples just aren't compatible? <laughs> no. church context how to relate to someone who's been in a divorce maybe how to, to, how to deal with the, um, the offending party I know there's, there's kind of and, and even 
there's like in, in your congregation, but also if you know another Christian who, I knew of this lady who, uh, she left her husband because he was a non-Christian and, and decided to marry a Christian. And is, is it right for me not to talk to that person again? Or how, how, like how, how, how should our attitude be to that, that person? To that woman. To that woman, yes. How should your attitude as a church member or as a church leader? Um, this, she's not. She's not in my church. She's just someone I've happened to to meet. She's Christian, and she. she so, in your view, she was unbiblically divorced. Yeah, is she, that what you're saying? The only reason she was divorced is because her husband was a non-Christian and she decided that it was obviously too hard to, to be married to a non-Christian that she was going to just divorce him and marry a Christian. It would be a lot so, easier. Man, he, 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 was, he was wanting to stay in the marriage? Oh, I don't know the full story. Hmm. Well, the first thing we've got to ask ourselves, uh, are they biblically divorced or unbiblically divorced? And uh, if they're biblically divorced, then, um, uh, then we can uh, regard them as a sinned against or abandoned spouse who needs all our care and encouragement and support. If they're, a, if they're an unbiblically divorced uh, person, then um, uh, ultimately they need to come to a point of repentance over that and seek to be reconciled with their uh, former spouse. Is that okay? So it depends, really. How does that sort of, if it's someone you just know, sort of putting, is that putting yourself in the place of God to judge their hearts? Because often you won't know all the details or whether they're, I mean, undoubtedly there's Yes, you're quite right. I think for for just for a a Christian, a Christian doesn't have to. A Christian doesn't have to make that. Uh, if a Christian meets that person, they don't have to make that evaluation. They just relate to them as they find them. If you're in the position of Christian leadership in the church, and that person wants to come into some kind of office or leadership role within the church then you have to make a judgment. Then you have to ask some questions and come to an understanding of whether they're fit and proper. <clears throat> yes, that would be my qualification on what I said to you. I, you know, as a, as a, as a Christian, you, you probably don't need to do that process with this woman. You just relate to her as you find her, someone who loves Christ. If she wants to lead the woman's ministry and, and teach seminars on marriage, then you might want to know a bit more. The, her, ideally the leaders of whatever church she is going to or maybe she left and went to another one they should even if she's in their church claiming to be a Christian it's, it's, they just used to work with really yep all that's, all that's in the mix there's too much just letting people come in who uh, no one knows whether they're biblically divorced or under but either they don't Leaders don't want to find out, it seems like. Too bad. Well, uh, is it necessary to find out in order for them to become church members? I think leaders, if, well, especially if they come single and they're not, and you don't know the story, church leaders should be asking them as part of the whole church membership thing what's going on. Because if they could or should be reconciled to be, you know, spouse or former spouse, or even remarried them if neither one of them is married. Yeah. If they come in your church, they're likely to marry someone there eventually. Well, it depends on church to church are different policies. For some churches, church membership just requires a credible profession of faith, uh, nothing more. Um, and anything more would only be required if they, if they sought office or at least a role of some kind. That uh, depend really on church policy. Is a 
councillor, how sort of hard should you try to um, convince someone that they shouldn't divorce it? There's a way they can work it out. I'm just thinking, like, I've, I've got a friend who is, she's a Christian, she is divorced, and um, the ex husband left her and um, had an affair and then went overseas. So she, I guess, biblically had reason for divorce. But she, he, he came back and was willing to work it out, but she didn't want to because she said it would hurt too much and she didn't want to risk being hurt again. So, from a counsellor's sort of point of view, do you, do you even try, or is, is it, does it have to be from their part that they're willing because it hasn't so this was after the divorce, he came back and wanted to be reconciled. So I know it was, that they'd separated, I think, completely separated, but hadn't divorced. Okay. Yeah. So then that two-year gap of grace, mm. that common grace allows us in this mm. country. Mm. And that two-year period of grace, did he leave that uh, other relationship? Yes. Or was willing to leave it and be reconciled to his wife? Yeah. And she said no. Mm. And the divorce went ahead. Mm. Oh, that's tough, isn't it? I mean, is she biblically divorced or not? Well, adultery did take place. Uh, I would certainly, in that situation, I would certainly uh, do all I could to encourage them to believe that, yes, they can be reconciled, give them as much hope as possible, and urge them to, to get the help they need in order to restore the marriage. Um, not wanting to minimise the hurt that she feels. It's that classic example, after they've been separated for a while, she gets used to being separated from all that hurt and the one that caused it. And um, Yeah, certainly uh, do all you can to encourage them to be reconciled rather than go ahead with the divorce. And there are a couple that remarry, they divorce and they remarry five years later. So, you know, as long as they don't marry someone else in between. It does happen. It does happen. So there's, even though she does carry on and actually push through a divorce, or has divorced already, it's still possible she could change her mind. Yep, even after divorce they can still be reconciled, yes. So, uh, you know, in this situation, they're now divorced and perhaps got other relationships, but um, uh, given the fact that he seemed to evidence some kind of repentant heart, it, 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 there's, still, there's still opportunity there for them to be reconciled as brother and sister in Christ. But that would be a good thing. That would be good for their own uh, restoration, you know, with the Lord. Okay, anything else? This, this is a question on uh, infidelity. Um, you mentioned how it affected uh, people. It was mainly, you were talking mainly on, how, on the effect of, of the two people in the room and then the relationship. But how, how does it affect, or well, say if it, if it uh, was the, uh, someone in a leadership, a Christian in leadership? Um, uh, uh, sin and how how does that affect the church and how should the, the church deal with that so this is a question about a leader who divorces or no, no, commits adultery commits adultery because you've, you've mentioned how it affects of course it hurts the, the person oh, I've talked about its effect on the relationship on the relationship right? yeah. the marriage relationship right imagine someone in a leadership it actually affects it has quite a big effect on, on lots of people. Uh, the adultery? Yes. Yes. So it has an effect on this relationship, their primary relationship, and it has an effect on other relationships that they have out here, including church relationship and leadership role. And and of course, um, you know, the, the church is a fairly unique institution that um, uh, it's the only institution in the country where a person's adultery becomes an issue for their ministry in any other section of our society if a guy has a commits an adulter uh, commits an affair commits adultery he doesn't have to quit his job uh, so if you're talking about a minister are you yeah potentially 
then um, yes, he he couldn't continue in that office while that issue remains unresolved. So when it's resolved, potentially he could? Mm, potentially. David was restored after adultery and murder. Yep. All of life is redeemable. I say potentially, you know, in some cases it probably it may not be advisable, but the possibility has to be there. Having said that, you know, the head of the CIA resigned when his adultery was made known. A position of trust, which was betrayed. So yeah, maybe there still are some jobs out there in our society which requires marital fidelity. I'm not sure if in New Zealand that would have been required. He's due, if he'd stayed in the job, he has to appear before go to court about that whole Libya thing, so who knows politics and what's really going on. He might have to go to court now, I don't think. Okay, uh, anything else about infidelity or divorce from a counsellor's perspective? An understanding. It will be something that you will face definitely in the church and in your counselling practice whether you are an, an in-house pastoral counsellor or whether you're a vocational counsellor you will, you will find this this will be a very very common issue that you have to deal with. Keeping the focus on the relationship and not now your your job your job as a counsellor is not to decide who's innocent and who's guilty. The, the the parties that come will be expecting that from you. He'll be expecting you to hammer him, she'll be expecting you to vindicate her. You can't afford to get pulled into that. Uh, that's why if someone comes to you and complains about their marriage, uh, then um, it's, you, you really do have to say to them, well, look, before you say any more, um, I really need to be seeing both of you together. Because otherwise it just ends up being gossip. And also, unless they're both together, you're not going to be able to bring any resolution that's going to benefit the relationship. Um, so, for instance, I might be involved in counselling a couple, and during the week, one of them calls him up and starts going on about, oh, you know, he didn't in the counselling, he should have said this, and he didn't say this, and boy, there's more stuff that you don't know about, and he didn't tell you, and he's been this and that, and I don't want to come again, just a waste of time, and 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 you know, and they got all this heap of stuff, and uh, uh, encourage them to come back, and um, and everything they've said in the phone call, you want them to repeat in the counselling when the other one is there, and you're there to help them. To, um, to face the issues, to face the truth, and to face the sin involved in the truth. And you see what you're doing, you're actually, the wonderful thing about couple counselling is you're not only helping to restore the relationship right there and then, and, and, and trust, and, but you're actually setting them up for a lifetime of how to resolve their differences of how to resolve issues in the marriage. You're teaching them how to resolve issues in the marriage. So for the next, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, they're going to have a marriage that works because you've taught them how to deal with the difficulties in the marriage in a way that doesn't create distance, but in a way that develops intimacy. What a glorious privilege um, to bless them and their children, yeah. and their children's children. If you do listen to that one... Pardon? I was just saying, if you did listen to the one during the week that calls you up, like if you do carry on and listen to them and you know, try and help them all that, and then you bring it back next week, whether you talk about this stuff or not, but sooner or later, it's going to come out that you, you've probably talked or you know more than that's right than, than the other one realizes, and then your trust is kind of that's right. You, if, you, if that, one of them or both of them don't trust you anymore, then that's very good. It's very good. So you can't entertain that phone conversation. You have to cut it off and say, let's talk about this in counselling. Mm. Otherwise, 
and you have to bring the, ref the, the report of the phone call to the counselling. So when you next meet, sit down with the both, you, you say to the husband, look, your wife called me during the week and this is what we talked about and I urge her to bring it to counselling. So, turn to the wife, would you like to say now what you're saying to me on the phone? And the husband sitting there saying, wow, I can trust this guy. Mm. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that your scriptures are so clear on that which is most important. And uh, you have given us marriage and what a glorious thing it is. And, and each one of us in the room tonight can testify to the wonderful blessings of Christian marriage. And uh, uh, Lord, your scripture has also dealt very robustly with, with the uh, effect of adultery and abandonment and divorce and the part the gospel has to play in all of that and, and Lord I thank you for the glorious privilege that we have within the body of Christ to help couples strengthen their marriage resolve their marriage difficulties resolve their marriage conflict to move away from distance and divorce towards intimacy and reconciliation and, and so bless generations of people children that are, that are saved from their parents divorce and Parents that are saved from their own divorce and, and, and a church which is saved from having to deal with the effects of a divorce. And Lord, we pray you'd give us increasing opportunity to bring this blessing to the lives of many couples and that you would increase, Father, our own capacity and ability, that you would help us to understand where our own hearts would, um, would harbour secrets and lies that would get in the way of intimacy and closeness in our own marriages and help us to be vigorous and robust in dealing with that before you and with our spouse. We thank you for our time together and pray that you can bless us and encourage us in the week ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, next week we'll have our final lecture on marriage and it'll be looking at um, more of the biblical teaching on marriage. Okay, thank you very much.